Hello there. In this lesson, we're going to go over the mathematics behind how to create and build one of these, a box. And more specifically, an open top box. An open top box being one that doesn't have a lid on top of it. It is open on top. Now, the materials used to create a box, if you were to ever take a box and, and unfold it, open it up, you find that it's just this. It's just a sheet of cardboard. It could be any material. It's just a sheet of cardboard. And with pieces cut out and then folded in such a way, we can build this box. Um, so that's going to be the objective of today's lesson, is how do we build this box? But, but more specifically, how do we build this box in such a way that we guarantee that it can maybe hold a specific amount of volume. We want to maybe say that it guarantees that it has at least a certain size to create, uh, to have at least a certain amount of volume. So, so how do we do that? Uh, and then we can even piggyback off that. How can we um, create a box that maybe has a maximum volume? The largest box that we can, can create. Um, so there's lots of questions that can come of this open box problem and that's kind of where today's lesson and video goes is to introduce you to the mathematics needed to um, create one of these that then we can ask and pose a, a whole bunch of questions about this particular box. In this lesson titled how to solve a polynomial inequality we're going to go over the type of problems used to mathematically model and solve our open box problem that we posed as an introduction to this particular lesson. We're going to go over in the video how to solve two types of polynomial inequalities. Uh, one that can be solved algebraically uh, using factoring techniques and number lines and one that can be solved graphically uh, using mostly the uh, graphing technology, our graphing calculators and some graphical properties of polynomial functions. Uh, in order to do this we're going to need to know some polynomial factoring techniques uh, including the rational zeros theorem and synthetic division which we have talked about in this unit already and also how to calculate zeros using the graphing calculator which is something that we talked about much earlier in the course. In this first of two examples we're going to look at how can we solve a factorable polynomial inequality and so the first thing I do when I check for factoring, uh, I notice in this particular problem that there are four terms and four terms is going to sometimes lend itself to a grouping technique. Um, however, looking at the coefficients of the first two terms, the 2 and the 5, and comparing them with the numbers here, the 37 and the 60, there's not a way that I can take out a common factor of 37 and 60 and get to 2 and 5. So the grouping technique doesn't work here. So instead I'm going to use the rational zeros theorem. And I'm not going to go over in detail how to do the rational zeros theorem in this particular video as we've done it before. Um, but the first thing I would do is I would list all the factors of 60. And there's a lot of them. And I'll just state them out loud. There's 1 times 60 and 2 times 30, 3 and 20, 4 and 15, 5 and 12, 6 and 10. Now there are all those factors of 60. And it could be any one of those numbers divided by all the factors of 2, which are 1 and 2. So it's all of those numbers divided by 1 and all those numbers divided by 2 as possible options. And it's quite exhaustive. There are a lot of them. Uh, so what I would do is narrow those options down by sketching or looking at a graph of this particular uh, function on the calculator. And when I did that, I'm going to kind of cut to the chase here and just share with you what I found. Uh, when I did that, I found that the graph crosses the x-axis at 5. So I would use synthetic division to divide out 5 as a 0 of this polynomial. And we should get a remainder of 0 here, if this is in fact a 0. So we bring down the 2 and we multiply together, we add together here, and we multiply, we add, and we multiply, and sure enough, x equals 5 is a 0 of this function, therefore we'll have a related factor, um, x minus 5. 
But let's take now this 2x squared plus 5x minus 12. And let's see if we can use more simpler traditional factoring techniques to finish the factorization. 2x squared is 2x times x. The negative 12 could be positive 4 and minus 3 and put in such a way that we add to the 5x in the middle. Okay, So we've got two of those factors there. We already had the, the 5 as a 0, so we can now write this problem in a factored form. The factored form of this problem would be x minus 5. That's what we had here, the positive 5, 0. And we've got these two factors down here. We've got 2x minus 3 and x plus 4. And so we've got here we've got the same polynomial in a factored form. We want less than 0. Okay, so we're going to solve this problem in the factored form versus the one the way it was originally presented to us. And so what do we need now in this factored form? Well, I'm going to find all the zeros. Okay, this one gives me this one gives me a 0 of x equals 5. This one gives me a 0 of x equals 3 halves. And the last one gives me a 0 of x equals negative 4. And we're going to use those zeros on a number line. So negative 4 would be farthest to the left. We have 3 halves in the middle of them. We have 5 farthest to the right. So what we want to know is then where on this number line, at what points, what numbers on this number line satisfy this inequality. Um, well, let's investigate just the zeros first, just these points. Um, we want less than zero. There is no equal to, so I'm going to go ahead and use open circles on all this. And what we'll do is we'll just pick numbers to test. I'm going to make a, kind of what we would consider a sign chart. I'm going to pick some numbers. So I'm going to pick something that is less than negative 4. Any number out here that's less than negative 4. So we might choose x equals negative 5. And what I'm going to do is take that negative 5 and put it in for all the x's that we see in the factored form. And I'm not interested so much on what the exact value is, just if it comes out to be positive or negative. So if I put negative 5 in for the x, negative 5 minus 5 is a negative number. If I put negative 5 in for this x, 2 times negative 5 minus 3 is a negative number. And if I put negative 5 in for this x, negative 5 plus 4 is a negative number. If we multiply three negatives together, what we get is a negative number. All negative numbers are less than 0. I want values that are less than 0. So this negative 5 works because it creates a number that's less than 0. So if this negative 5 works and it's to the left of negative 4, then that means everything to the left of negative 4 is going to work. So we shade all this in. Now similarly, I'm going to pick numbers in between each of these values and work them out the same way. So here I might pick x equals 0. So 0 minus 5 is negative. 0 minus 3 is negative. 0 plus 4 is positive. I've got two negatives times a positive, which comes out to be positive. Positive numbers are bigger than 0. I want less than 0 things, so we're not going to shade any of that. I'm going to pick a number between 3 halves and 5, so maybe we pick 2. 2 minus 5 is negative. Let's see, 2 times 2 is 4 minus 3, that's positive. 2 plus 4 is positive. A negative times 2 positives is a negative number. Negative numbers are less than 0. We want, again, less than 0 values. So we are going to shade this part of the number line. And finally, we're going to pick a number that's greater than 5. So I might just try x equals 6. 6 minus 5 is positive. 2 times 6 minus 3 is positive. 6 plus 4 is positive. Three positive numbers are positive, which are bigger than 0. 
we want less than zero things, so we don't want that either. Our solution can be summarized then in two ways. We could say negative infinity is less than x is less than negative 4, or 3 halves less than x less than 5. We could give it like that. Um, or we could give it in an interval notation. We could say negative infinity, negative 4 that way, and 3 halves to 5. Either one of these uh, ways to write the solution would be acceptable. In this second example, I'm going to look at one more polynomial inequality, this one that does not factor for us. Uh, and, and so how do we solve this polynomial inequality that doesn't factor? It still has solutions just like the last one did. Uh, we just can't find its zeros the same way. So we have to find another way to, to find the zeros. And the answer to that is we're going to investigate and look at the graph of this inequality um, as a function here. And so let's just begin. I'll begin like a rough sketch and then we're going to use the graphing calculators to help us out with this as well. Okay, so maybe um, a little information about the graph first. You know, what do we know so far? Well, we know that it's a third powered polynomial function. Um, so we know that its in behavior is going to be different on either end. Uh, we know that it's negative, which means that its in behavior, it's going to come up. It's just real rough. This is not the real graph here, but I know it's going to go up on the left end. And it's going to come down on the right end. Um, because it is third power, I know that this particular function would have at most, let's write this down, it would have at most three zeros. Okay, so it could cross the x-axis at most three times. Now let's go ahead and use the graphing calculator to help us see a graph of this function. So if you get yours out, you can just kind of follow along and do the same thing I'm doing. Negative x to the third. We've got minus 6x squared plus 18x plus 6. I'll bring it up a little closer so maybe we can see a little bit better. And so there it is typed in. If I graph it, And sure enough, it did go up on the left, and we're going to see that it does come down on the right, just like we suspect, and it did cross the x-axis three times as well. Um, so let's go ahead and maybe just real rough, just I'm going to transfer that to my paper, to my rough sketch. Um, so the graph looks something like this. It came down first. Now it went off the screen. I don't know how far down it went, and I'm not interested really in how far it went. Um, but it, then it came back up cross to the x-axis again, continue back up, and then again, I don't know how high up it went, but then it came back down, kind of like that. That might be the general shape of the graph um, with disregard to how high and low the function actually went at these two spots, okay? But I'm kind of just trying to illustrate where it crossed through the x-axis, it's zeros. And I've got my end behavior there too. So what we want to do now is calculate these zeros, these x-intercept values. Where does this graph cross to the x-axis? And we've done this plenty of times on the calculator before, so this is not new to us. Uh, we're going to calculate, so second trace, I'm going to calculate number two, the zeros. Bring this up a little higher so we can see. I'm going to calculate the zeros. And I can see the cursor right there. Let's just say we get this one on the right first. So I'm going to left bound and right bound it. So the zero I can see, and I know it's hard to read off the calculator, so if you're following along, you're gonna be able to read this on your own just fine. Uh, this zero right here is at, I'll use two decimal places, 2.43, okay? Now I'm gonna continue that process uh, by finding the other zeros. Um, so I need to get, I'll get the one in the middle next. 
That one in the middle is to two decimal places, negative 0 0.30. And I'm going to do it one more time and get the one that's all the way out there on the far left. And that zero is negative 8.12. Okay, so there are my three zeros for this particular function. So if I were to do what I did in the last problem and, and draw a number line, the number line would have on it these three points. And then I'd make the sign chart left of the, the furthest left one, right of the other one, and then in the middle of these two, just like in the last example. But instead of doing that, since I've already built this graph, I'm going to go ahead and use the graph to solve this problem. What I want to know is where is the function greater than zero? Um, zero, greater than zero, means where is it uh, essentially above um, the x-axis or above the line y equals zero. Okay, so look at the x-axis here. Okay, where is this function above the x-axis? Well, it's above the x-axis out here. And it's above the x-axis between those two values. Translated onto my number line, if the x-axis is a number line, if I just drop this shading straight down, it's shading on the number line there, and it's shading on the number line right between these two values. Okay, so what's my solution? My solution is um, negative infinity less than x less than negative 8.12 or negative 0.3 is less than x is less than 2.43. Or in interval notation, maybe preferred negative infinity to negative 8.12 and negative 0.30 to 2.43. So there you've got now two approaches. We've got the factoring approach using the number line and the sign charts, or we've got this graphical approach where the graph is kind of just basically overlaid on the x-axis. The x-axis is like a number line, and we can use this uh, graph to determine where we're either greater than zero, above the x-axis. Um, that could be flipped around. It could be less than zero, below the x-axis. Um, we can interpret all of this just kind of visually, graphically, and if we know the properties of polynomial functions as far as in behavior properties, how many zeros to expect, etc. We can piece together those graphical properties to solve these polynomial inequalities um, very quickly and efficiently.